All right, I see I put my message in the wrong chat window. Thank you, Brett. I I love that song. That is my favorite song from my friend Leanne Phillips' CD, Mikhail. She was a guest last week, and this week I thought that it was important to get a little bit of sanity and clarity and beauty and some music because we're going to be delving into a, a topic again that is just ugly and horrible and the things that we're allowing to happen to our world because we just don't think about them. We're busy living our lives. We're busy being propagandized and lied to, you know, in this multi-generational coup that has taken everything from us, everything from us, you know, and then we see things like asteroids falling to earth and we wonder, well, will that happen here? And if it did happen, You know, if we only had 24 or 48 hours to live, if we only had a week to live and we knew about it, would we change our lives? Would we do anything differently or would we continue to abandon our own power and our morality and our quest to just be good citizens, do our job, and ignore the corruption around us? Every day, women and children and men, innocent women, children, and men, die because of war and our ignorance and refusal to stop this atrocity from engulfing our planet. Every day, the money that could go to make this a wonderful planet is spent on death and destruction and nuclear radiation and depleted uranium and on and on and on, you know, and we ignore it. We ignore the ongoing BP Gulf massacre. We hand it off to somebody else to do something about it because we're busy. we got to pay the bills, but... Who are we really paying and whose lives are we serving when we continue to overlook the murder that occurs every day paid for by the money they take from our paychecks and our energy? Who do we serve when we look and we feed our own family and ignore the families next door who are hungry because they've been screwed by a system where profit is put above all and Wall Street walks away as the untouchables while we suffer and pay and die? And what about the war profiteers who are all of our political leaders? You know, folks, I I watched a movie last night called Equilibrium. It's an older movie. But in the future, it's starring Christian Bale, and the entire population is drugged every day and monitored because they don't want you to feel. That's a sense crime. And if you feel and if you actually collect artifacts from your family, well, then you you have to die because you threaten the enforced peace. And the peace is enforced through violence. You know, how long are we going to continue to overlook that destiny that's awaiting us unless we choose to act, think for ourselves, find our moral compass And understand that we've been compartmentalized into working against ourselves. And we're destroying our planet and our world in the process. Now, my guest tonight, Christina Consolo, also known as Rad Chick, is a woman who I admire greatly. While I can sit here and and talk about what's going on and in my own way, you know, drive myself, my husband, and I'm sure most of you crazy, but... She's actually out there on the front lines, and she's reporting about what's happening here on our planet. She also hosts her own radio program. She has um, FukushimaFacts.com. Uh, she also has uh, Radiation News, and Christina is it, I think, Tuesdays and uh, Thursdays. I'm sorry, Tuesday, I've got yes. one. Tuesdays okay. and Thursdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on UCY TV. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining the program. And okay, so tell me tonight, am I supposed to call you Christina or Radjik? <laughs> <laughs> you can call me Christina. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Now I've never made it a secret about like who I am or anything because I figure at this point, really, we have nothing to lose by speaking out and trying to tell other people what's going on who are too busy to really pay attention, at least in my own family and and my circle of friends, most of the people that I know are are working so hard, they're exhausted by the end of the day. They don't have 
time to really pay attention to what's going on and make a lot of these connections like, you know, some of us have time to do. So I feel obligated, really. Yeah. I know, I know exactly what you mean. And I feel obligated to learn as much as I can about as many different topics as I can and try and get us all on the same page because we're all facing this together. And when we are so busy that we forget to look in the mirror and we forget that we're, or actually that we avoid confronting the fact that we're protecting criminals and allowing them to steal from us, you know, we've got to wake up. So I'm so grateful that you do what you do. And now, would you tell us actually how you got into this? How, How did you become active Well, I had a a back injury in 2008 that um, kind of sidelined me. I'd worked for 25 years in ophthalmology, and I sat on the board of directors for a worldwide imaging organization, and I was pretty well known in my field. And then I had this this back injury that happened at work, and our whole world just kind of stopped. And our family went through some real trauma for a couple of years until, um, you know, I got a lawyer to represent me for a disability case. And when Fukushima happened, I had lots of time to read. And the more Ah. I read, the more alarmed I became. All right, we're back with Christina Consolo talking about having a back injury, which put her out of work. And then when Fukushima happened, she had a lot of time on her hands and started to investigate. And Christina, why don't you, why don't you take it from there? Sure. I I was really interested in the accident because I was always a supporter of nuclear energy in the past, and I have some family that works um, at reactors in the U.S. And I started talking to them, and I started, you know, watching the news, and after just a, a couple of days, the story completely dropped out of the news, and that was right after they suspected the first reactor of having a meltdown. It turned out there were actually three, which are ongoing. And... I wasn't sure really at the time of the accident of how significant it was. And I was worried about going public with the information because I thought this might be so bad that maybe people shouldn't even be told because there's nothing we could do about it. Like I I didn't know. And it took really months of studying the problem and talking to people who worked in the industry and talking to physicians and researching what happened to the Chernobyl disaster, not just in terms of the accident itself, but what happened to the surrounding land and the people that live there, to realize that we could actually mitigate our way out of this by certain things that we do in our daily lives, like avoiding rain and snow and eating the right foods and making our health a top priority. And when the accident happened, um, four days afterward, they detected... Uh, large amounts of radioactive fallout on the West Coast, which gradually moved across our country and into Europe and around the the Northern Hemisphere. And about three weeks into the disaster, they already detected it in Australia. And a lot of comments that were made by so-called experts at the beginning was that the particles would never reach our shores because they were too heavy, they would fall into the ocean, and that it would not go into the Southern Hemisphere because the hemispheres are separated by Uh, jet streams and so forth. And none of that turned out to be true because the disaster ended up being so much worse than people were told. And in reading about Fukushima and the nuclear industry and the cover-ups that have gone on, especially during the Chernobyl disaster and, and continue to this day, you start to realize that the nuclear industry and all of these agencies that have been set up and are supposed to monitor them actually protect them and cover up the extent of when things go wrong. And when something goes wrong in a nuclear reactor, what happens inside of a reactor is never meant to get outside. It's like the power of the sun, basically. And not only was it coming out of three reactors, and later we learned that there were 10 to 14 plants that had problems, possible meltdowns at other plants in Japan besides Fukushima. Now, people talk about Fukushima, and that's great, but... Japan had a number of problems at other facilities, and we don't even know what's going on at those facilities now. So, you know, and and you start, you look at this from a health perspective, which I was interested in because I worked in clinical research. I actually ran 
the largest clinical research lab in ophthalmology in um, the United States. And I was in charge of all the study patients that we did, and a large number of those patients were um, kids with cancer. And when a, a child gets cancer and they go in for radiation treatment, like in brain cancer, it causes swelling in the retina, and so then they lose vision. And so we would photograph these children, and I wish I knew then what I know now because I would have asked every one of these parents, how close do you live to a nuke plant? Hmm. And, you know, what I've, what I've found out since is that we have, like, huge um, areas of population around these plants in the United States that even under normal operations are constantly releasing radiation to the atmosphere, and it rains out in these communities, and these children are very sick. They have chronic illness. They have cancer. They have, um, you know, problems with drinking water and things like that, and autism is, is another thing. So, I mean, if we have, you know, it's hard enough to be a child today and, and not be sick. Like, if you're sick, you have no quality of life. You know, you don't feel well. You can't participate in things at school and, and have, like, normal relationships with people if you feel bad all the time. And I had four daughters, and luckily all of them were really healthy, and I just, you know, I couldn't keep quiet about this, especially when there's so many different ways that people can protect themselves. And then we have the additional problem of all the reactors that we have here, all the releases that are ongoing all the time, the continuous radiation that's coming over from Fukushima and is not being properly monitored by all of our agencies in the United States that we pay taxes for, the EPA and the FDA and um, the USDA and, you know, nobody's talking about this problem, even though we've had high levels measured in things like milk, which all kids drink. And so, you know, it needs to be either discussed or we need to find ways around these agencies to make this information known. And the only thing I could think of doing is really talking about it and trying to recruit all the smart people that I could that were interested in this problem, that have other ideas and other avenues that they can get the word out as well, and we can all figure this out together. And there's a real sense of urgency about this because children are so affected by radiation in, in their cells because their cells are dividing. And this is really important for women who are pregnant, for babies. The radiation that we might be exposed to, even if it's a slight amount in our water, to a baby it's a thousand times worse. And if a mother is mixing tap water and formula, to feed to her child and has no idea this this kid you know might grow up and have problems they'll never be able to link it back to radiation in the drinking water and that's just one way that we're getting exposed wow all right folks we're going to have more from christina consolo right after these messages please stay tuned all right knocking at your door tonight the door of your consciousness the door of your heart because Unless we can feel and empathize with people who are less fortunate than ourselves, we won't be interested in helping them. You know, we cannot continue to ignore what's going on and expect our children to have any kinds of lives whatsoever. And that's why I'm calling peaceful warriors who are listening to my voice. Calling peaceful warriors. It's time to make a choice. The madness is upon us and knocking at the door. The madness is the fear within. The madness calls for war. Calling peaceful warriors. Think what battle has achieved. Just death and mass destruction for those who were deceived. By lies from politicians whose masks are all now falling. Use your own volition, peaceful warriors, I am calling. Because the fight is within. Be a moral person. The more of us who understand what's going on, the more we'll realize that nothing is more important than saving our world from the psychopaths who are currently destroying it. Not our jobs, not our paychecks, not our cushy vacations. We've got to come together and recognize our, con our common enemy 
is threatening us all. All right, Christina. Um, that was awesome, that, Karen. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, I told you I wrote some stuff, and it's it's what I feel. We have to come together, but we have to do it peacefully. We can't accomplish change with the same mindset that got us here. No, and, and everybody who is waking up to these problems, we all have, like, different ways, different gifts that, that we can use to promote and share information with other people. There's such an extraordinary opportunity in people waking up together and helping each other and realizing all the things that we've been told our whole life are wrong. But, you know, like I said, there, there's a lot of opportunity there and, and you can sing about it. You can sing on live radio and that's, um, you're a very brave girl for doing that. <laughs> I mean, people who like are really good at writing poems and they've written poems to me about the nuke stuff and I'll read them on air. And if you're a good writer, you know, you could start writing articles and send them around or, or making, you know, even music videos and putting them on YouTube just to reach different people in a lot of different ways. You have to, you know, just kind of figure out what your, your gift is or what your interest is. And if you live around Hanford, you know, maybe you just want to study Hanford. You could spend a lifetime reading about just what's going on at that site and share what you know with people from that perspective. You know, and that's just well, one avenue. Uh, it's definitely a journey as well, I think, because now I worked as a professional singer for a lot of years, so it's um, it was just something that I love to do. I'm not the best singer in the world. I just feel it with my heart. I've always had great empathy for people's pain and for... And, and a moral compass that wouldn't allow me to consciously hurt people or overlook people who were being hurt. So when we, uh, with Nukushima, <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. Fukushima, who knows if it was nuked or not. Actually, do you think that there was any truth behind that? You know, I've, I've stayed away from a lot of the conspiracy stuff, although I was asked to do a show about it one time where we just like really went into all the possible things that could indicate that it was an event that was done on purpose. And I think it's, it's really frightening that it could happen at all, but that it would be done on purpose is even worse because it could happen at any of the, any one of the plants over here, you know, and one of the theories was that, um, that a nuke was placed inside of reactor three when an Israeli security firm did some work at the plant a couple of months before everything went bad. And that at the time they put a camera into part of the containment that was actually a stereoscopic camera. And that's the kind of photography that I did when I worked in retina. And so I know what stereographic cameras look like. And that was bigger than any stereographic camera that I've ever seen. And some people thought that it housed a nuke. And there's no reason to put a stereographic camera in a containment system because you do it in order to see in 3D. And it was basically pointing down a hallway that went in a circle. So there, there was no reason to have that installed. And at the time, the theory is that this security firm, in addition to putting a nuke into Reactor 3, could have also um, put a jump drive in the control room, which they had access to. And that's all been confirmed that this Demona security plant from Israel did do work at the site and they had access to the control room and they could have inserted Stuxnet into the computer system, which would have basically um, been remotely um, operated and it would reset all of their settings to make it look like things were okay in the reactors when really they weren't. Do you have any or have you come to any conclusions about that yourself? Well, the computer virus is a problem for sure. We've actually used it against Iran. Um, we destroyed some of their centrifuges in their uh, in enrichment facility, their uranium enrichment facility, a few years ago. Uh, by doing this, the same thing, basically what people have said, they, well, I'm trying to think now which plants, that we've never learned the, the number of plants here, but recently the Department of Energy released a statement saying we had several uh, power plants in the U.S. that were recently um, had malware discovered on their computers. And so it could mean that somebody went home and used a laptop that was intended only for use at the new plant, that they went out on the Internet without any protection, and something got downloaded into it, and then they took it to work and, and used it at the new plant, and that virus would have transferred that way. Or it could be an attack from 
another country, but we did have several plants that were affected by that in the last few months here in the States, although the Department of Energy won't say what plants they happened at. Wow. Well, when I hear this as well, when actually when Fukushima happened, and living up in um, in Oregon, only about 70 miles from the coast, uh, when when we first heard about it, my husband and I just looked at each other and we knew that it was much worse than they were talking about. And personally, what I believe, um, and I would love to be wrong on this, but I believe it is on purpose because all these governments are talking about overpopulation. You've got the Georgia Guidestones where they want 500 million people. They predict in their books, they write down in their books that they want three world wars. The third one is just about ready to begin. It's all about consolidation of power and money and and just the absolute worst compartmentalization and the most horrible people imaginable who are in power. Charlie's going to have uh, Sybil Edmonds on, I believe, next week. And she sent us a copy of her book. And reading about the FBI after 9-11 not having a Turkish language selection there, not having any people who really understood it, and hiring people whose self-vested interest kept them from reporting crimes of the highest treasonous nature is is just upsetting. We're, we're, we're so missing the mark here of what we could be and can do once we stop thinking that we have to obey the current policies, justify the current policies when we see how much damage is done and pay for the policies. Christina, how do we wake up? Well, if you wake up in one aspect, like it, people, a lot of people, and I know this was true for myself as well, you learn about Fukushima, you start to wake up to a lot of other things and you start to see all these correlations between the politicians and the industry and the payoffs. And, and I saw some of that when I was working that I always thought was questionable, but because the doctors that I worked for acted like it was normal daily business, um, such as the relationships they had with reps and so forth from, from the pharmaceutical industry, you know, you choose to ignore it. You're getting paid. You're doing your job. And it's hard to make waves when you're in that position. It is hard to do that. But, you know, until we get heart-centered thinking, until we allow that what happens to us happens to all, we won't change it. We'll be right back, folks. Another day the sun shines down on you and me while all around we take our masks and put them on to wear until a day is done. Not thinking, just reacting to the problems we're attracting. Try not to look too deep. Most of us face this world asleep. Why should we know? Why should we care about all the problems over there? Our stomach's full. Our house is neat. We're not sleeping in the street. Why should we care for those who do? Our lives are here. Our clothes are new. We pay our rent. We do our jobs. Why should we care about those slobs? Why should we care when we're not there? We work until the sun goes down, we drive back home while all around the nightly news blares on TV filled with more atrocity. Babies dying, mothers crying, we're denying. So much killing, we're so willing, blood is spilling. Why should we know, why should we care about all the problems over there? Our stomach's full, our house is neat, we're not sleeping in the street. Why should we care for those who do? Our lives are here, our clothes are new. We pay our rent, we do our jobs. Why should we care about those slobs? Why should we care when we're not there? Because, folks, we will be there if we don't care and if we don't wake up and if we don't start to understand what is really going on. Christina, you were talking about when you were working and making good money, making a living, and how it's easy to overlook what's going on because the doctors overlook it. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that because I, I do understand and maybe you can help some of the people who are also caught to start to look beyond what they think they know. Well, sure. I, I was really fortunate that I got a job actually while I was still in high school working for an ophthalmologist who was like world renowned for cataract surgery. And um, I'm, I got really close to his family and I got like to go to a lot of meetings and stuff with other people in the office. And the first meeting that I went to was in Chicago and I was probably 18 at the time. And, um, there was a, a party cause 
whenever you have like an academy meeting where doctors come from all over the country to take classes and get credit hours to keep their um, their licenses, like they have to get so many hours per year towards continuing education. Some of the staff will go to these meetings as well, and the pharmaceutical companies kind of sponsor all the parties and dinners and things like that. So the very first event that I ever went to, they had um, a company, and I don't want to say the name of the company, but they created these eye scanners that were like the latest and greatest thing. So they rented out the Museum of Natural History, and they had a party in the museum, and it was just for all of the eye people to go to. And... I went with this um, female physician who was older, and she was, like, really down to earth and really cool, and a couple other people from my office. And the first thing I noticed is that there were escorts there. (laughs) And I was like, wow, you know, when we got out of there, I was like, what's with all the hookers? And she's like, (laughs) oh, nobody talks about that. Nobody talks about that. But that's customary at all of these meetings that the pharmaceutical companies hire escorts to go to all the dinner parties and all of the functions. And, um, you know, it's like just an acceptable practice. And it happened every meeting that I ever went to in 25 years. And it's just the way business is done. And, in fact, the last meeting I went to was in New Orleans. And another company who at the time was promoting these eye injections had rented out the House of Blues And I took a guy with me who I had been dating for a while. He went with me down there, and we went to this party. And as soon as we walked in there, he's like, what's with all the hookers? And I'm like, oh, that that's like all the parties are like this. And he's like, you've got to be kidding me. And he was really disturbed by that. And it was only really then that I thought, you know what, this isn't right. (laughs) Like It really isn't. This is why the doctors never bring their wives to any of these things. (laughs) There, and, okay, all know, the doctors was, are busted. But it wasn't just at these yearly meetings that this kind of, like, stuff goes on. Um, the reps would come in, especially when I worked in the clinical research setting. We had fellow people who were doing their fellowships in retina that would work out of our office. They were actually still in training. And the reps would come in there every day at lunch, and they would bring them Red Wings tickets and Tiger tickets and um, theater tickets and, you know, coffee mugs and mouse pads. And sometimes when they didn't want them, they would give it to the rest of the staff. And in addition, they would give them prescription pads that were already all filled out with the medication that they sold. And all the doctor had to do was, like, check a box and sign their name. So they made it as easy as possible for their stuff to be prescribed. And it was kind of like whoever was around the most, their stuff got prescribed the most. You know, so it's like this huge, like, PR sell job that's going on in the background all the time. And, in fact, that company that rented the House of Blues for these eye injections, they ended up getting sued a couple years ago because the eye injections that they were selling were for people that had very severe inflammation and what it was doing is when the, the injection was given, it was actually destroying retinal cells. And we had had people signing forms saying they realized this wasn't FDA approved, but they took responsibility. And it was like $1,200 a shot in the eye. And some of these people had the, the shot done like 10 times. And, you know, I mean, it's not even proven to do any benefit, but because these guys were always in there. Um, their stuff got promoted. And it's just, it's really wrong. And there's some incredible physicians that worked at this practice that thought that this was okay. And when they think it's okay, of course, the staff isn't going to really question it. Yeah, you're paid to do what the doctor says. Um, Mm -hmm. I got into this movement because of a health issue. And when I got through mine and started seeing the genetic manipulation and everything of all the food and all the really started learning about what was sanctioned that we were eating and the experiments being done on us. I was also just shocked. But I used to have to take um, my mother-in-law to the doctor's appointment. She really was into them. And I would watch as we were waiting for her appointment. I would watch all these different pharmaceutical reps come in with their suitcases and their free samples and... At the same time, I was working with a company, uh, a health food company, and understanding that it's really better, you know, to get your vitamins, your nutrients from food, which we can't do anymore because it's so denatured. But 
I saw the big push there, and I learned at the through the other business that I had that you know a good question to ask doctors is do they have any financial ties to the drugs that they're prescribing, and have they ever done any research whatsoever aside from simply taking the word from the rep, a lot of whom are cheerleaders and some of the uh, very attractive people specifically so that they'll be enticing to these physicians um, instead of actually doing the, the research and understanding what they are giving their patients. Uh-huh. So, well, we're going to have to go to a break here um, in a couple of minutes. So I know that you've got some news items in there. And, folks, I want to take some calls for Christina after this break. So if you want to call, the number is 877-342-6673. And in the meantime, I know it's not much time, but we can get into it on the other side. Do you want to talk about some of the news tips that you were um, brought up today? I want to follow your lead so that we get the ones that you really want to get out there. Okay, yeah, there's never a shortage of news about the nuke stuff, that's for sure. Well, the plants here with the United States, how about that? Oh, well, they found, um, you know, they had a couple of workers die in the past week at two, possibly three different locations. They found um, what appears to be human remains in one of the intakes at the Cook plant in Michigan. They also had two workers that um, were found unconscious. One was in a highly contaminated area of the plant that uh, were dead on arrival to their local hospitals. So those investigations are ongoing, but uh, certainly is, uh, has been an interesting week for the nuke workers. And I've had some of them actually contact me and said, you know, I never had any idea that my job was so dangerous until I listened to your show and I've read some stuff about like nuclear divers, the people that go in and actually clean out these intake systems because there's so much water that's pulled in. This particular plant where they found the remains was on uh, Lake Michigan on the west on the west side of the state. And, you know, their jobs are extremely hazardous and they make like 10 bucks an hour. And they actually wear these decimeters that will go off if they're in an area where the radiation is high and then someone will speak into their headset and tell them move to the left or move to the right to get out of the radioactive water. And so many of these guys end up having, you know, their thyroids out or they have heart problems. And they don't talk about the health effects of radiation at all to nuke plant workers. They're not trained for that. Even the physicists aren't trained for that. And one of my my friends who worked on the decommissioning of the Fermi 1 plant, which had a meltdown in just south of Detroit in 1966. He was a physicist, and he wanted to take um, a radiation effects on health classes because he worked with spent fuel, and they told him, you don't need that for your job. They don't want these people to know how dangerous their job is, and many of them develop cancer later in life because of the exposures that they're getting at work. Well, I think that's part of the plan, actually, for depopulation because people get sick and you make money off the pharmaceuticals like you were talking about earlier. It's it's all connected. we got war profiteers. Um, we have pedophiles. We have thieves, murderers, all who are in charge of our global situations. Our governments are bought out, and we have to deal with the ramifications of all this that they try and hide from us as they make us sicker and sicker, and we just keep being shoveled off into the system. And now with Obamacare, it's going to be much harder for people to get care. Um, they're putting taxes in around here that will be implemented in the next couple of months. They're asking for, I think, an extra $300 per household here in Oregon. Um, I forget which county it is, to get more police out there because they don't have enough police out there on the streets, you know. And we're overlooking all of these things. Are, are any of the people who are contacting you, have they quit their jobs at these radiation plants? Have they been able to do that? No, most of them uh, travel around as like contingency workers and they're hired in for special projects. Okay, so they're not exposed all the time. No, but they may be starting to be more selective about what plants they work at because some seem to have many more safety issues than others. Good, good. We've got to take a break now. After this break, if you've got questions for Christina, 877-342-6673. Please stay tuned. This is important information. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is Friday, the 22nd of February, and I'm here with my guest, Christina Consolo, a.k.a. Radchick, who is giving us the real dirt on the nuclear problems that are facing us globally. We do have a caller, Richard from Washington. Welcome to the program. Yeah, great show so far. Uh, I was uh, in physiological psychology and wanted to do medical research, and as soon as I got into the research, I realized it was pharmacological research. It had nothing to do with medicine, and I hit that door uh, running. Uh, it was really bad news. But what really good amazes choice. me is, is we, what was that? It's a good choice. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I knew that was the best choice right from the start. But what amazes me is we never want to use common sense in evaluating what's happening around us. You look at the medical community, how do they treat this quote-unquote uh, disease called cancer, uh, radiation, chemotherapy, and surgery, and what's happening in the world around us. Fukushima, radiation, uh, chemtrailing and fluoride and chloride in the water, chemotherapy, and war, uh, surgery. I mean, we never really kind of see that the plan is used repeatedly over and over in a cyclical basis to uh, run this uh, depopulation program, even though it's in our face at all times. Christina? Yeah, and the the more you learn, the the more disturbing it becomes really to see what we've been exposed to. We actually still have fallout from atmospheric testing that happened in the 50s and 60s. I mean, some of that stuff is still up there. And... um, you know, basically, if you treat your your life, your body, and your health like you already have cancer, you have nothing to lose. Basically, mitigating for a lot of these things helps with the chemtrails and the other toxins that we're exposed to because there's a lot more in our water that's bad for us than just radiation. And so, what it, you know, I tell people is just treat yourself like you already have cancer, Make sure that you get enough sleep, that you reduce stress, that you don't eat fast food or processed food. Get used to cooking from whole foods. It's not about convenience anymore. It's about longevity. And if we were wrong, if this was a complete hoax and there was no radiation, you haven't lost anything by being a healthier person. And really what the the name of the game is, is, you know, not only life expectancy, but um, having a life that's more worth living because being sick is uh, no fun, which I can attest to, (laughs) becomes a quality of life issue. And even if your life is shorter, if you have a a better quality of it, then I think overall it's not a bad trade-off. It certainly isn't what I would choose for myself and my children, but uh, we've made changes in our life because of Fukushima that's actually enhanced our life in a lot of other ways. It is important to really begin to take other other health steps and to not focus on only the negative. And I think also to to realize that we're spirit, having a human experience, we're energy, we're sound, we're vibration, we are capable of miracles. We are the instruments through which miracles flow. And in order to remember that, we need to step back, take a breath, make a connection within, and begin to understand our world truly is being threatened as the future of our children. And when you see all these underground cities that are built for the people who are running the show and destroying us, you know something is up. Um, Christina, what about some of the methane problems that we're dealing with? Well, the the methane events have been um, widely documented since um, about 2008, they started noticing that there were large releases occurring in the Arctic, and then since that time, in fact, um, there, there's also been a lot of events where there's been explosions at mines, mining operations. There's been large releases of methane from coal seams, even far down in Australia. It's been reported, and, and the people that study this have said it's not like anything they've seen before. And, you know, whether our Earth is going through a cycle and some of these things are helping it along, uh, I don't know. And there's not a whole lot we can do if we have some kind of methane extinction event, which has happened numerous times throughout Earth's history. So um, methane does tend to rise in the atmosphere. And there's a lot of other gases that are released from the ground, like hydrogen sulfide and radon. And I thought at times that the radon could also be detected and cause some of our high radiation numbers 
that we see, especially if earthquakes occur within a couple of days before or after the high numbers. And we saw this recently happen in Alabama and Arkansas. Um, but we also have, you know, three basically volcanoes, hydrovolcanic events that are going on at Fukushima that are continuously releasing radon from the um, corium that's in the ground and is anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 degrees. So there's a, a synergistic relationship between, you know, those things, some of the weather events that we're, we are having could also be attributed to some of the radiation that we have in our atmosphere. Uh, there was something called the flint Worcester sequence that happened in the 60s following the largest atomic detonation that was done in North America. It spawned off a series of very large tornadoes that went through the Midwest and killed people in the Flint area in Michigan and then up through the East Coast. And for a while it was debated in Congress because even congressmen said, wow, we just did this atomic test and now we have these F4 tornadoes happening far outside of Tornado Alley right in the same weather system that came from this atmospheric detonation. And, you know, what happened right after Fukushima is we had Jocelyn, which was um, a, a severe tornadic event. And we've seen, of course, tornadoes in January and February. And there could be a lot of things that are causing this. And that's why we need all the smartest people in the world trying to figure out what's going on and how do we fix it. Because the companies that have caused these problems aren't doing a very good job. I mean, just look at what's happened to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, just last week, an oceanographer said that BP may have activated a fault in the Gulf of Mexico. And if that fault connects through the sinkhole area in Louisiana or up through the New Madrid, I mean, we could, you know, look at a, a large earthquake event that's been precipitated by this. And then, of course, we have the the sick seafood and, you know, dolphins being born without eyes and shrimp without legs and, and all this going on in the Gulf of Mexico. And all the core exit that's been dumped in there, and the Cynthia, which they injected into the well to make the oil come out faster, that's a living computer-generated microbe, and it was never tested before out in the environment until BP used it on the Morcondo well. And now, you know, they've found core exit in pelican babies that migrated to Minnesota. So, I mean, there's lots of other things in our atmosphere, and they could, how they're interacting with each other, I don't know. I'm not a chemist, and, you know, I just see that there's a lot of problems that need to be addressed, and I know the more that you simplify it to help get your, your brain around it, what it all comes down to is just living healthier to protect us from some of those things. And then we have, of course, what, you know, the Wi-Fi signals and the electromagnetic currents that affect our health, too, in very profound ways that people aren't even aware of. It is absolutely amazing when you start looking at all these different pieces and putting them together because we are ending up just being sick, all of us. You look here in America, um, we have such obesity. We're addicted to fast food, and now it looks like horse meat hamburgers, and to genetic manipulation and the vaccines. I mean, we truly are being assaulted in every front imaginable. At least that's how it appears to me. Yeah, I used Richard, to... are you... Go Is ahead, Richard Christine. still there? I was wondering. He's awfully quiet, usually. <laughs> he must not be. Okay, go ahead, Christine. No, he, he's there. He's just listening. He enjoys uh, definite dialogue. Okay. Um, and it's okay right now because we don't have uh, any other callers. But, Christina... What would you like to add? Well, I, I would like to talk about some things that are going on from the legal perspective about Fukushima that many people aren't aware of, but it's really important and could be actually um, groundbreaking when it comes to people at TEPCO and these other agencies in, in terms of taking responsibility for not only this event, but of um, covering up the fallout from the event itself. We had All right. Well, let's do that on the way back. And um, so we'll come back and talk about that. Right now, um, 877-342-6673 if you have a question. I hear we get charged by the minute, Richard, so you're going to have to listen on your radio or online. I mean, thanks very much. We'll be right back after these messages.
Christina Consolo. We have Charlie in the chat room. Charlie, if you feel like joining the conversation, you are welcome to do so. And now, Christina, I'm going to toss the ball back to you because uh, we have limited time here, and I know you have a lot of topics you want to get into. Let's talk about the 70,000 military that you were telling me during the break. Yeah, after the um, earthquake and tsunami in Japan, we had 70,000 uh, U.S. military service members that were either already stationed there or were brought in for relief efforts, and the uh, it was called Operation Tomodachi. And there were several um, destroyers at part of this group. It was basically the entire Seventh Fleet that was involved in this. They brought... I forget, it was like 70,000 tons of food, or 17,000 tons of food, I'm sorry, and water and blankets and supplies to people who lost their homes. Because this tsunami actually came about five kilometers in from shore, so the devastation was just unbelievable. And there's a really good documentary called Surviving Japan that a gentleman named Christopher Noland did. He was actually over there and volunteered for the efforts, too, and was near... It, the area of the Fukushima plant, but these um, these service members were flying in and out of um, areas that we now know were severely exposed to radioactive particles from the reactor explosions, especially Reactor 3. And Reactor 3 contained um, MOX fuel, and we've never had a nuclear accident in history where a MOX reactor has blown up. And what's so bad about this MOX fuel or mixed oxide fuel is it's mixed with 6% plutonium. And there were um, these fuel rods that were in there. They're about uh, six feet long and they weigh two thirds of a ton. And one fuel rod with 6% plutonium, if it was blown into the atmosphere and evenly dispersed, it would have the potential to kill 2.89 billion people. It's just from the amount of material in one fuel rod, and there's, you know, hundreds in this reactor. And so these guys were not warned that they needed basically Tyvek suits, respirators. Um, you know, they, they needed heavy-duty protection from the elements while they were flying in and out of Onagawa and Sendai and these different cities because they were flying right through radioactive plumes. And CNN ran a story where... There were a bunch of service members that came back from a mission, and they had Geiger counters on the ship, and as soon as they started measuring these guys on their jackets and vests and so forth, the Geiger counters were alarming like crazy. And the NRC kind of deferred everything to Japan, to the Japanese government, on whether or not they were at risk, and the Japanese government said, just listen to TEPCO, and TEPCO was saying, we have everything under control. It's not that bad. And, of course, now we know that it was absolutely horrific, especially for people that were close to the plant. And one of these ships, the USS Ronald Reagan, was about two miles offshore when Reactor 3 blew up. Now, I interviewed an attorney on my show and one of the service members who are now sick. There's been a number of... um, of people who have come down that were part of that operation with uh, rectal bleeding, with leukemia, with thyroid problems. Uh, One of the crew members was pregnant at the time, and her baby has birth defects. And it started off with eight sailors that were part of this lawsuit, and they are suing the Tokyo Electric Power Company for not providing adequate data that would have allowed these ships to, and helicopters and so forth to protect the people that were part of this operation. And now since the story broke, the lawyer had about 150 people that have contacted him. And I mean, these, these guys and girls have very severe health problems. They have brain lesions. They're all in their early 20s. And they're having immune system problems, and and, um, one of them had an eye tumor, and he had to have the eye removed, and, you know, it's it's very severe stuff. And the fact that there were 70,000 military members in this area that were exposed, I don't know how many of these people have actually left the military since then, have retired or finished their time, but... We need to kind of get the word out about this because if you were part of that Operation Tomodachi and you're having problems, originally the Department of Defense said that they were going to create a registry 
and have all these people as part of the registry, and they were going to track their health through the Veterans Administration. And about two weeks ago, they disbanded the registry and said it's not needed. I'm not surprised. You know, chew them up, spit them out, ignore them when they're sick, ignore the highest rates of suicide in the military in our history. It's just, it just gets worse, folks, until we stand up for our rights and unite. We'll be right back after these messages. If you want to call in, the number is 877-342-6673. All right, it is time again to really look at what is happening here. And with, with this lawsuit, Christina brought up some interesting points as well because uh, maybe it's time for us to really start getting Sue happy in terms of not only TEPCO but the individuals who are the ones who are making these decisions. Um, Christina, why don't you finish talking about what we were discussing on the break? Yeah, you know, after having a a few conversations with this attorney and I ask him every time we talk, so when are you going to start the class action for the rest of North America, which eventually will be needed, and he knows it's needed. He has a very good handle on this. He was actually um, kind of world-renowned for being an asbestos attorney. He went up against the asbestos industry uh, in the 80s. His name is Paul Garner, and it's garnerlaw.com. Um, You can email him if you were in Operation Tomodachi and you have questions for him. His email is pcg at garnerlaw.com. And a lot of people have asked me, too, you know, when are, what about the other lawsuits? Like, what about the rest of us who are having health problems or who have lost people in their families already and have questions or, you know, we need testing done and things like that? But the way Paul Garner has explained it to me is you have to start somewhere. And so you start with the people who were at the front of the line, who got it the worst, and you start at the source of the problem, which was the Tokyo Electric Power Company. And then you go from there. And where that will end up is anybody's guess. But, you know, I've tried to talk him into, like, starting a whole consortium of attorneys that just deal with radiation problems is we have people that live in the area of Hanford. If you've lived there, if you lived in that area between like 1945 and 1955, you were exposed to major amounts of radioactive releases. They had a a criticality at that reactor site. They were dumping terabecquerels of radioactive water into the Columbia River for years and not telling anyone. It's only because recently 19,000 documents were released from the Freedom of Information Act that we found out some of these things. And, you know, we have information now from the NRC, too, that the U.S. government was well aware of how much radiation that these guys were exposed to and didn't do anything about it. And we have phone conversations that have been released because of the Freedom of Information Act. And after what I went through with my disability case for two years, you know, I, I hate courtrooms and lawyers, but sometimes it's really necessary. And as Paul Garner had said to me, too, if you think of it like a pyramid, you guys are trying to fix things from the top down. And it's never going to work. The government is never going to acknowledge this because a bunch of people are talking about it on Facebook or on alternative radio. you got to go from the bottom up, and you just got to start suing the crap out of everybody who's responsible for this. All of the corporations who have put their best interests ahead of the health of the people that live in these areas where they've been exposed, um, they need to atone from what they've done. They need to be held accountable. And the only way you hurt these guys is by, you know, their pocketbooks. Agreed. Um, I was trying to type to Brett to bring Charlie in. I think he'd like to join the program. So, Brett, if you're listening, and also I want you to know, Christina, um, I'm all about from the bottom up and trying to change from the inside. It's United We Strike, so I guess we're going to have to have unitedwesue.com. <laughs> <laughs> And get these guys who only think that profit is above the rest of it. It is, again, folks, if you have a chance to rent uh, Equilibrium this weekend, check it out. You know, look at that. And I also highly recommend uh, Kevin Costner's 500 Nations. But we do have to start suing them. We do have to start also suing the individuals, which is what um, Bert is teaching us. So you don't only go for the corporation. A lot of times the corporation is is so well protected 
that you can't get it, but you can get each and every one of those people whose self-vested interest keeps them from becoming accountable. Uh All right. It looks like any second now we will be joined by the... By Charlie McGrath, who usually takes a long weekend and has three days off. So it's ringing. So, Christina, uh, there he is. Charlie, are you with us? Hi, Karen. Hi, Christina. Hi, Charlie. How are you? Good. I heard heard her say three days off like it was a vacation time for this guy. (laughs) (laughs) We were trying to make it sound good, you know? (laughs) It's it's appreciated. I I love the fact that you, uh, you come on here and... Give us Karen's corner. I see you have fifty plus people in the chat room. That's a nice full room in there. And and I just came in uh, into the chat uh, in at the towards the end of that last uh, segment. And Christina, I hadn't I hadn't heard the the depth of this story. I didn't realize it was up to one hundred and fifty people, uh, one hundred and fifty service members who were uh, feeling the effect of this radiation exposure. And I, and Karen said it at the end of that segment. You know, the, these men and women are being chewed up and spit out and uh, and forgot about, I believe, like no other time in the history uh, of our nation. And and that might sound crazy to some people, but listen, it isn't. You know, we have uh, we have uh, young men, young women serving multiple tours in combat zones, coming back completely mentally uh, uh, drained and, and destroyed in a lot of cases, physically destroyed, mentally destroyed. Uh, and we, they don't even they don't even make the headlines a, a, anywhere. It doesn't even make the you know the the third, fourth, fifth page of these newspapers. We just completely have uh, uh, forgot about this uh, meat grinder that we're putting our our youth into, uh, all in the name of what you know, all in the name of uh, spreading democracy or uh, uh, trying to go uh, after weapons that don't exist. Trying to I, you know I, I don't even know. But when I, when when I I hear these kind of stories and we uh we have folks on who are working with our vets it, it really it really does uh, touch home to me because uh, you know my service uh as well as family members who are uh you know have been touched by the effects of this carnage even the department of defense won't acknowledge that depleted uranium can cause severe health effects and if you've seen any of the children being born in fallujah that's not only happening to people that live there, it's happening to some of our soldiers who are coming back and having babies, and those babies are having problems. And you go to the DOD's website, do a search on depleted uranium, they said there's no health effects associated yeah. with it. And that's basically what they're trying to say now about a MOX reactor explosion with ships right offshore. And, you know, they, they had this registry, they said that they were going to help, then they decided not to. And there really is no other recourse but to set up some kind of medical fund for what these uh, people were exposed to. Yeah, and, and when it comes to when it comes to the efforts of uh, this lo- lawyer who's uh, taking these cases on, you know, I've I've looked into these things before and looked at uh, some of the history of, uh, of veterans who tried to uh, turn back to their government uh, for help, and it's it's about as difficult a challenge as you can imagine. I mean, they they take. Uh, they take no responsibility for anything. They they have the the ability to push things off for decades and decades, and sometimes uh, you just completely and totally ignore it. Uh, and you know, with with the help of a complicit media, uh, it, it just goes away. You know, it goes away, and and we wonder why we have so many homeless vets, we have so many suicides by our veterans. Um, you know, e- even if, and I know some some Gulf War vets who are are suffering from uh, Gulf War syndrome. And, uh, you know, even if you can you can get a doctor to uh, diagnose you and uh, say there's no other reason why you would probably have these kind of symptoms unless it was because of this Gulf War syndrome or, or whatever the case may be, whatever your ailment may be that is uh, service connected. So what? I mean, you get you, you get even a full disability. Some of these veterans aren't, you know, is barely uh, making a living uh, and they're they're completely broken and battered. And, uh, you know, again, I, I always fall back on the, the for what reason. Um, and it, it's sickening. It's sickening to think that this can be happening uh, to who knows how many of, uh, thousands of our uh, young men and women. Uh, and not, some of them are not young. I mean, some of them are, you know, they're, they're dragging out the reservists, you know, 50-year-old uh, guys, sending them over to these uh, regions. Oh, sorry, I'm babbling on. We're going to be right back with more Karen Quintosado, Christina Consolo. 
Hey, wait a minute. How can we have Consolo on there? What happened to the middle name? We're going to be right back with Rad Chick, Karen Quintosato, and more Wide Open News Radio. Hang tight. All right, we're back. I was just wondering whether or not Charlie would jump in there. We're all radioactive tonight. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I'm not jumping in. I, I should have jumped uh, in the last one. It's just habit. It's all right. I like it. You know, it gave me a little bit of a break there, and it's nice to have um, you be able to talk with Christina. And actually, I really enjoy also that we, we're all kind of family here. You know, we pass around our guests, and we get to know each other, and it's a good thing. I, I agree, and it's been too long since we've had Christina on, and we haven't got a report for a while. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see her back here, Christina. Red well, you know, I, I was reading, and this kind of affects you guys, too, because of your locale, but, um, you know, this Hanford thing that's going on, this, this place is part of the reason why we have such an arsenal of nuclear weapons. All 60,000 of our nuclear weapons were made at the Hanford site, which is really in the news right now because they had one tank that was leaking very highly radioactive water into the ground. They have 177 tanks there that hey, hold something like 50, you're, you're referring to, 53, right? 53 million gallons of highly radioactive water. And right before we went on air tonight, the governor of um, Washington State said that there's actually seven tanks that are leaking. Hmm. And it was that site was originally built to make because of the Manhattan Project. In fact, the bomb that we dropped on Nagasaki was built there. But, you know, when it when it comes to this, like, you know, the reason for war and all this, I mean, the whole nuke industry was because we needed to make plutonium for making weapons. And it's the only reason that they're in existence, really, is to harvest the plutonium from the reactor process. Well, I think it's been proven pretty uh, pretty much uh, without a doubt that they're, you know, these uh, sites aren't even break even. I mean, they don't they don't, uh, you know, the energy that they produce um, is subsidized to to the hilt. And they're actually money lose proposition as far as energy goes, aren't they? Oh yeah, no, they're they're horribly inefficient, and all they do is really boil water, and then they have all this plutonium production that's made as as kind of a side effect of the process. And there's 500 pounds of plutonium per year generated out of every functioning nuclear reactor, and then the government gets to keep all that and, and make more bombs. Of course, you know, that's what our money goes for. We want new and more inventive ways to kill people. We're tired of just of just shooting them with bullets. Now we have to melt them and blow them up and use, you know, long-range acoustical devices and on and on and on from the military madness that we are all suffering from. And yet the war continues. We talk about this and on Monday morning we'll all go to work and life will continue until enough of us finally really get that Living our lives as normal and ignoring and justifying the criminals in power is not doing us any good whatsoever. It's just speeding our demise. Charlie? Well, I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say to that other than uh, I got to go to work one day. I, and until I don't, until I, until I uh, no longer have a job, I mean, uh, I, I get that, you know, I understand the, the concept of you know the United We Strike weekend is to not to, not to comply and, and opt out, and it is hard for a lot of people uh, uh, who are who, tie, who who still are fortunate enough to be to be working and have a job that uh, it's hard to 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 get unplugged uh, from the mainstream. It's hard to unplug uh, to get unplugged from uh, from the system, um, and that's why one reason I like the weekends is because you know it it, it gives us a chance to. Uh, for the people who are unable to get out of, uh, you know, get out of the rat race and and uh, uh, pay attention to what's happening around them, it gives them an opportunity to get involved, uh, at least at some level, to uh, you know, to learn this information about, uh, you know, how how we got to where we're at and what's being done in our name. Well, and the more that we do know and the more that we understand, and I, I know that it's tough to to not show up and to not have money and to not be able to pay your bills. I mean, we're caught in this big, horrible, uh, manufactured world, and that's why at least one day a month on the 15th, folks, while you are learning about all this stuff, start planning and thinking about what our lives could be like when and if the majority of us ever say no at the same time. We quit being slaves. 
We want to actually have lives that are fun. You know, we want to explore our gifts. We want to heal our planet instead of having our money stolen for death and destruction. Christina, we just have a couple of more minutes here. Um, are there any uh, new topics that we missed tonight? Any of the, uh, the the pieces that you put in that you wanted to talk about that we haven't touched on? Well, we have the, the sinkhole situation, which I've talked about with Charlie in the past. And um, the situation down there is is pretty grim for the residents of that area. They've evacuated about 300 people so far, but there's still a large part of a community that's left there, and they're all in the process right now of lawyering up to with the Aaron Brockovich firm who stepped in and said hey, these people need to be evacuated. Just this week, a geologist came out and said that there is a two-mile-wide gas field that is um, surrounding the sinkhole. The whole area is sinking, and this gas field actually extends. And it's just right under the soil. It's under um, 60 uh, pounds per square inch of pressure, and it's in an area where this salt dome, which we've used for decades to store stuff like radioactive materials, and we have our strategic oil reserves in some of these salt domes. The whole area appears to be collapsing, and they have people that they've brought in from Brazil that are experts in trying to vent off some of this gas. But uh, just yesterday, a uh, story came out that now this bubbling that's been going on in the bayous and around this sinking salt dome area is actually happening happening 50 miles away from that site in Louisiana too so this we don't know how big this event could possibly be or where it's going to go nobody knows because it's never happened before there's never Yeah and what was it, for those that haven't at least you talk about this before what is the reason for this occurring the, the they, speculative reason they have no idea the geologists have never seen it happen they have no way to fix it so they're just kind of watching it. And, you know, every day they're finding new bubbling sites. People who live in the area have been going around posting videos on YouTube of, like, just boiling water in these bayous around the area that wasn't there before. So there's gas leaking up from the underground areas around these salt domes. And this may have all started, according to Matt Simmons and someone named... Um, uh, Reed, a geologist with the USGS, because a lot of these faults that are in the Gulf of Mexico can connect to the New Madrid and up through the St. Lawrence Seaway, and they're having major pressure problems from a gas well in the Gulf of Mexico right now. It's another Ooh. problem that they have no solution for. They're injecting some heavy fluids into it to try to get it to stop, but an oceanographer came out and said that this, there might have been a fault activated from the BP disaster and whether or not that's now spreading through Louisiana. If you look at a map, I mean, they all line up, and if you follow it straight up, it goes, you know, right to the New Madrid fault zone, which has been having some small earthquakes over the last two years. So lots of questions and um, not a whole lot of answers, just a lot of people trying to pay attention and figure out what's going on because we have such a huge population density in that part of the country, and we have a lot of nuke plants that are yeah. in that part of the country, as well as pipelines that run all the way from Louisiana up to Indiana, and all of those would be affected if we had a you know a, an earthquake situation or further subsidence in this area in Louisiana, which looks yeah, like it, could it, I mean, it's, just, it's, a, it's another story that that is barely barely getting any uh, uh, mainstream uh, coverage whatsoever. Right. All right. We with about two minutes left or so, uh, can we listen to your program? And stuff. I'm on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time <coughs> on UCY TV, and the show is called Nuked Radio with Radchick. Yeah, and I tried to be a guest on there the other day, and we ran into some uh, snafus. <laughs> Ever since I did that military <laughs> interview, we've, we've been getting hit like crazy. But it's not just us. A lot of other um, talk shows have told me that they've had weird things happening with their Skype and with their uh, flash settings on their computers and lots yeah, of crazy stuff going on. Yeah, and I've had I've had uh, uh, several stories sent to me over the last week of uh, brigades of uh, people who think they're doing good by going out and monitoring uh, alternative sites and trying to be uh, you know uh, disrupt the chat rooms, disrupt the message of uh, 
uh, of uh, whatever host or, or guests are speaking. Um, I mean, there certainly is an assault, an all-out open assault on uh, anybody who is uh, daring to speak out against any topics of the day that, that go against corporate special interests. War yeah, is declared upon the, the people. We had a show in the chat room earlier, but he he didn't uh, he didn't want to call in. I would have listened to right. him and set him straight. <laughs> I was hoping you would. It was a different Skype room where he was talking about Fukushima and all the radiation just being a big psyop, and there's nothing to it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I figured I we'll, we'll send him some that. shrimp from the Gulf or from it? from uh, Nukushima. Yeah, already oiled, greased, ready to glow. Some California tuna. Yeah, everything's going to be glowing here soon. So Washington, Oregon, I don't know, folks, you know, we're just we're just going to have to pour a cocktail. Actually, when Charlie joined, I, I poured a glass of wine. I've already been hitting it here for the weekend's coming. <laughs> what else are you going to do? It's early. That's what I love about you. You're, you're ready to rock. <laughs> There's a lot of opportunities for people to create businesses out of all these disasters, you know, just growing food indoors, yeah. aquaponics, you know, starting businesses like that and, and checking food for radiation, being able to attest that, you know, if you're selling seaweed, that it's, you know, not radioactive, things like that. All right. Well, hey, guys, I, I appreciate you. Let me come on, Karen. Uh, Karen uh, Quinn Tostado every Friday night. Uh, 5 o'clock west, 8 o'clock east for two hours, Karen's Corner. And, of course, Christina Consolo, the rad chick. Thank you very much uh, for hanging out with uh, Karen. And, guys, again, thank you for having me on. Monday, first hour, hour number one, Gary Hendershot, Alternative Energy Hour. Hour number two uh, is going to be myself and Sheriff David A. Clark. Should be a great program. Please enjoy Jeff Prince because he is coming up next. And I hope everybody has a good weekend. And we will talk to you on Monday. Have a good night. Peace.